Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Laura Lubbers and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy, or CURE. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled Epilepsy, Pregnancy, and Contraception. Pregnancy and contraception can be a difficult subject for women with epilepsy to discuss with their doctors. However, it is critical for the reproductive health of yeah. nearly 1.1 million women with epilepsy of childbearing age. This webinar will focus on the research surrounding epilepsy and pregnancy, as well as provide strategies to help minimize risks for both mother and baby. This is the first installment of our 2019 Leaders in Epilepsy Research Webinar Series. And we are grateful to the Band Foundation for sponsoring this, as well as the rest of the webinars this year. CURE's mission is to find a cure for epilepsy by promoting and funding patient-focused research. CURE's robust grants portfolio has led the way to advancing epilepsy research across areas as diverse as infantile spasms, post-traumatic epilepsy, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP, and genetics. Today's presenter is Dr. Elizabeth Gerard, who is an Associate Professor of Neurology at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Gerard's clinical practice at Northwestern Memorial Hospital focuses on the care of women with epilepsy. This includes contraceptive and pre-contraception counseling, as well as the management of epilepsy during pregnancy. She is the current site principal investigator of the MONID trial, which is a clinical trial examining maternal outcomes and neurodevelopmental effects of anti-epileptic drugs, a very important trial in our community. She's also interested in the use and understanding of continuous EEG monitoring in the critically ill and is the site principal investigator for the Critical Care EEG Consortium. Before Dr. Gerard begins, I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions. You may submit your questions anytime during the presentation by typing them into the Q&A tab located at the bottom of the Zoom panel and clicking send. My colleague from CURE, Brandon Laughlin, will read them aloud during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We do want this webinar to be as interactive and informative as possible. However, to respect everyone's privacy, we ask that you make your questions general and not specific to a loved one's epilepsy. I also want to mention that today's webinar, as well as all previous and future webinars, will be recorded and are available on the CURE website. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gerard. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real privilege to be here and I'm uh, giving this webinar. I wanna thank Dr. Lubbers for organizing and Brandon for organizing this and inviting me to be your first speaker. Um, it's been really great to work with CURE um, and the families that are involved in CURE over the years. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, today about a, an area of epilepsy that's very important to me and in my clinical practice, which is uh, helping with women with epilepsy understand how epilepsy and their seizure medications can affect them and the reproductive choices about pregnancy and contraception. Um, as Dr. Lubbers mentioned, I have a clinic that specializes on the care of uh, treating epilepsy in women with a lot of attention to these reproductive issues. Brenda, not sure I'm able to control your screen. Okay, it's a little bit, there's a little lag. Um, just by way of disclosures before this talk, um, I, I have given similar talks um, in China um, uh, sponsored by UCB to travel there um, to speak to patients about pregnancy and epilepsy. Um, I've been involved in clinical trials uh, sponsored by Sage Pharmaceutical and Synovian. Um, and as Dr. Lubbers mentioned, I have research support um, from the multi-site uh, trial with uh, the maternal outcomes and neurodevelopmental effects of anti-epileptic drugs, where the uh, lead PIs are Kim Metter and Paige Pinnell. Um, and that is very, a very important study to the kind of things we're talking about here. So the issues that I'm gonna talk about today um, are ones that are sometimes difficult for patients to talk about with their doctors. Um, and if the doctors don't necessarily bring up this conversation, uh, patients have indicated in prior research that it can be hard to, to bring up. 
a lot of patients get the understanding implicitly from either doctors or their family members that they shouldn't really be talking about having children or thinking about having children because of their epilepsy. Um, and so it's really important to get this information and, and, and bring it out and have frank conversations with it. People, patients may wanna know, can I have healthy children? Will my seizure medications be okay when I wanna get pregnant? So just a couple of overview points where I always start in my clinic is that for the most part, women with epilepsy should not be discouraged from uh, carrying children because of their epilepsy. The majority of women with epilepsy will have normal, healthy babies. And pregnancy and epilepsy though should be planned well in advance to try to re reduce risks to both mother and baby. If it's possible, it's possible to choose medications with lower risk and medications, uh, lower risk for pregnancy. And we recommend thinking about that even when you're a teenager, not necessarily planning your pregnancy, but asking how will these possibly affect a future pregnancy. So what I do in my clinic and what most epileptologists do when they're seeing women who are considering pregnancy is they try to balance the risk of seizures with the risk of medications. We all know that seizures can be dangerous, um, obviously to both mother and baby, it can lead to um, personal harm to the mom, there's a risk of SUDEP for untreated seizures. And so in general, we do feel that it's really important to continue medications for patients who need medications to control their epilepsy. But what are the risks of the medications? What do we know about them? And how do we explain them to you? These are the things that in our community we've worked pretty hard on. Um, and I have to say that although there's a lot more research that needs to be done, we know a lot about the medications that we use to treat seizures in pregnancy, and in some cases even more than over-the-counter medications because we've been studying them for about 20 years now in very rigorous ways. Um, so when you do research, you have to focus on an outcome point. So I'm gonna talk about the outcomes that have been looked at um, the most in the research studies that we have. Um, the main thing that has been examined in research studies of women taking seizure medications during pregnancy are major congenital malformations. Major congenital malformations are fetal malformations which affect physiologic function or require surgery. I'll show you some examples of these. These are the best studied outcomes to date. It's important to understand as I talk about them that these malformations occur in the general population. So people without epilepsy and without with not taking any medications also have a risk for these malformations. Um, and we'll talk about how the risk differs uh, in women with epilepsy taking seizure medications. Historically, uh, when people first started looking at the children born to women with epilepsy, they focused on what we call minor congenital malformations, which are slight irregularities of the finger or the face that don't require surgery. These are not common. They've been reported with some of the older drugs. Um, and uh, it's not something that we have a, a lot of data on really the risk for this. The sort of new phase of research um, in the last more like 10 years uh, for women with epilepsy is trying to understand how the uh, seizure medications affect the cognitive development of the children who were exposed to the medications during pregnancy. And so I'll touch on that as well. These are, um, this is the focus, one of the fo focuses of the uh, trial that I'm involved with. So here are some examples of major congenital malformations. Um, these are um, some of the more common major congenital malformations. They're not all of them. Um, uh, and when I say common, I don't mean they commonly occur, but of those that occur. Some, one of the most serious ones is spina bifida. Spina bifida is the picture up in the left-hand corner here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this, the, the one up here is a um, outpouching of the spinal cord. Um, there's a range to the severity of spina bifida. It can be mild and cause um, sort of neuropathy or, uh, in the feet or weakness in the feet, um, or it can be more severe associated with brain development abnormalities um, and, and many other illnesses as well. Other malformations that we see are abnormalities in heart development, um, so abnormal connections between two chambers of the heart, which can require surgery. Um, cleft lip and cleft palate is a, um, another malformation that can be seen. Um, these are where the, the lips did not fuse together completely or the top of the palate did not fuse. It can affect uh, eat feeding, um, and so these also would need to be surgically fixed. Uh, hypospadias is another malformation. This is um, in male penises, they, the, the outpouching where the urine comes out can be farther back and that can be fixed surgically as well. 
important thing to know about malformations is that if these occur in a pregnancy, they start to occur very, very early. So things that affect the spinal cord, the spinal cord forms when uh, 28 days after conception, which is about six weeks of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So that means that when the woman first finds out that she's pregnant, um, the, the, any risk in terms of spinal cord development has already occurred. So a strategy which is, oh, I'll fix my medications or change my medications once I'm pregnant is not a good strategy. Um, ideally, you want to make any adjustments or any preparations for pregnancy well in advance of the pregnancy. Um, a lot of the data that we have in terms of the risk of seizure medications in terms of uh, mal major congenital malformations is from large pregnancy registries. So they're registries um, throughout the world that have been tracking women who are pregnant um, uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, the one in the United States is run out of Massachusetts General Hospital. It's the North American uh, Pregnancy and Anti-Epileptic Drug Registry. And you can enroll yourself if you are pregnant, you can um, self-enroll yourself in that registry at the information that I put there. So this is a summary slide of some of the drugs that we know the most about. Um, I keep track on an annual basis of what these registries are publishing and try to keep track of the risks related to malformations from each of the registries. Um, and the registries don't how look at do their studies exactly the same, so they're slightly different numbers in different registries, but looking at them across the board is, is very useful um, because then you can kind of see what the range is. And what you can see for of the seizure medications is that consistently valproic acid, which is also known as Depakote or Depakine, is associated with the highest risk of major malformations. Um, so these malformations in, across the registries range, the risk ranges from about 5 to 14%. Um, so while that is much, much higher than the baseline risk of about 1% to 3%, it might not be as high as what some people have in their mind, but it is definitely much higher than other seizure medications. Topiramate is a medication that um, also seems to have an increased risk of malformations, although the numbers of the individual studies are still smaller, so about 3 to 9%. Topiramate has been associated specifically with cleft lip cleft palate, um, and that's one of the reasons why the FDA gave it a, a sort of um, a higher rating in terms of risk in pregnancy than other medications. Um, carbamazepine, um, we consider sort of a medium uh, risk drug, low to medium risk. Um, and I still think it's a very reasonable option for women who need to be on carbamazepine. And for lamotrigine and levetiracetam, these are the two drugs that have, the low, have consistently had the lowest risk in terms of the risk of major congenital malformations. In some studies, not too different from the general population, and some studies slightly elevated compared to the general population. For most of the seizure medications, um, the recent research is showing that the risk seems to increase the higher the dose of the medication. Now, dose may not be the main issue. It may actually be people's blood levels, but what we, the information we have available is based on dose. So we try to keep doses lower when we can at a dose that best controls a patient's seizures. Often taking more than one medication during pregnancy may increase the risk of malformations, especially if one of the medications is valproic acid. There's also some recent research from the Australian Pregnancy Registry showing that if topiramate is part of a polytherapy combination, that that also, or two drug combination or three drug combination, that also seems to increase the risk. Um, but it's less clear that if all combinations of seizure medications in risk, in, increase the risk of malformations, it's starting to seem, we used to think that was the case, it's starting to seem that it's really about the, the drugs that are in the set of combinations. And moreover, very recent research has actually shown that perhaps not only is it the dose of the drug, the type of drug that's in the combination, but the dose of that drug as well that is really driving the risk of um, of malformations. So these are things that we're continuously looking at. There is generally a trend, and we can see this in the Monid study, sometimes to use combinations of drugs that have lower risk to avoid using a drug with higher risk. Um, so cognitive development, you know, we talk a lot about malformation risk and in general, you know, guidelines on whether a drug is safe or not, when you ask about, for example, Tylenol and stuff or other things that you might ask about, a lot of it's driven by data on malformations. 
But of course, parents are also very appropriately concerned about the effects on cognitive development. And that's something that's newer to the table and that has taken a while to get really good studies looking at that. But there have been several good studies recently looking at the risk of exposure to seizure medications and the effect on the cognition of the child who was exposed to them. So again, consistently, valproic acid or Depakote has been associated with poorer cognitive outcomes in children whose mothers took this medication during pregnancy. Um, on average, there seems to be a decrease in IQ points uh, by about 10 IQ points, um, lower than what would be expected or lower than in children who are exposed to other medications. Um, and there does seem in some good studies to be an increased risk of autism or autism spectrum disorders in children who were exposed to valproic acid in pregnancy. That doesn't mean that if you're taking valproic acid during pregnancy, your child will have autism. The numbers are still low, um, just like the malformation numbers, but there is an increased risk. Um, and these effects on cognitive development do also seem to be dose related. So we see more of the effect on higher doses. That doesn't mean that there is a safe dose of valproic acid that doesn't have these risks. But if you do need to take valproic acid and there are some patients where that is the only drug that works for them, we recommend trying to figure out if you can be on the lowest dose possible. Um, other drugs um, and their effect on cognitive development and behavior and autism risk is still being studied. So far, IQ does not seem to be significantly affected in children exposed to lamotrigine or, or levetiracetam, so that's lamictal and Keppra. Um, but uh, there's definitely a lot more research that needs to be done, um, and that's one of the main points of the MONEED study that we're involved in is looking at the cognitive development of the children who are on these medications and other newer medications. So what can you do to prepare for your pregnancy? Um, talk to your doctor early on, even when you start taking a medication, even before you're thinking about getting pregnant, about how the medications might affect a future pregnancy. If possible, once you're thinking about getting pregnant or even before, change to a medication that's known to have a lower risk of pregnancy. The best medication for you is still the medication that best controls your seizure. So we don't want you switching to a medicine that doesn't work for you just for the sake of pregnancy, but we definitely want to give a lot of thought in terms of risk reduction and what kind of changes might be made. It is recommended to take folic acid. Why we recommend, um, and the American Academy of Neurology recommends taking folic acid for all women of childbearing age and definitely when they're planning pregnancy. What is not known is what's the appropriate dose of folic acid. So we use folic acid because traditionally uh, exposure to folic acid has decreased the risk of neural tube defects in women in general. Um, the data for its effect in women with epilepsy taking seizure medicines is, is mixed. However, there is some nice research showing that it does seem to be associated early taking a folic acid with higher IQs and a, re a reduced risk for autistic behavior. So we do recommend taking folic acid um, early on um, and before planning pregnancy. Um, the recommended dose is anywhere between 0 0.4 to 4 milligrams a day. Um, Folic acid one milligram can be given by, pres by prescription in the United States, which is helpful because if you try to buy it over the counter, it tends to be either in a form of 0.4 or 0.8. It will say 400 micrograms or 800 micrograms, that's 0.4 and 0.8. So it's helpful if your doctor gives you a prescription. Most um, epileptologists who work in this field recommend taking between one and four milligrams of folic acid during uh, when you're planning pregnancy or during early in pregnancy. And most OBs would recommend that as well. And we do also recommend a prenatal vitamin. So what else can you do to prepare for pregnancy? And again, this is a process that ideally starts, you know, even years before you plan to get pregnant. Um, but, you know, one thing to ask is if you're still having seizures, should you better understand them? Should you do epilepsy monitoring to understand what's the cause of your seizures? Are your medications right? And might you be a candidate for actually epilepsy surgery? Uh, the picture on the right is a patient of mine who came to me on three seizure medications with frequent seizures, um, and we worked hard to evaluate her and have a temporal lobe surgery, which was successful. Um, and she is now um, doing extremely well with a, now she, her daughter, I believe is about four and a half years. We just saw her recently. Um, and she's part of the study. She was able to reduce down to just lamotrigine for pregnancy and stay seizure free. So by doing that surgery, we one and improve the quality of her life, but we also helped her plan a safer pregnancy. Another thing to think about is talk to your doctor about do you understand the cause of your epilepsy? 
Um, and since if you guys are following Cure webcasts and Cure in general, you probably know a lot about the boom in genetic uh, testing that's available for patients with epilepsy and our dramatically increased understanding of the genetics of epilepsy. Um, so in many adult, adult epilepsy genetics is another focus and area of interest for me recently because of the overlap with what I do here. Um, not every patient needs um, genetic testing before they get pregnant, and we'll talk about that. But there are a couple of syndromes where it's important for you and your doctor to recognize that understanding whether there's a genetic cause might have an implication for your, um, for your, for your child and for planning a pregnancy. Um, it's important also to understand that most people these days, or a lot of people, get offered prenatal genetic testing with a genetic counselor by their OBs, and that is not the same as neurogenetic counseling. So that kind of screening, which looks for sort of common diseases that can exist in certain ethnic populations, is not the same as genetic testing that focuses on epilepsy or the cause of epilepsy. Um, so just by way of example, um, I can't, it, the, the scope of genetic testing for adults with epilepsy is quite large, um, but this, this is an example that has compelled me and really to started, have started my career focusing on looking at genetic testing for patients with epilepsy. Um, this is a patient, um, a woman with epilepsy who has a periventricular nodule. So if you look at the MRI here, if those of you who are familiar with MRI, MRI is gray matters on the outside and this darker color is, is white matter. This patient has these little nodules that are lining the ventricle that are not typically there. Um, and that's not a common cause of epilepsy, but we see it in epilepsy centers not infrequently in women. Um, and in some cases, this can be explained by a mutation in a gene called filamin A. Um, and so this is an X-linked mutation that patients can have and they can pass on to their children. So a woman who has a filament A mutation like this patient um, will have a 50% uh, chance of not passing the gene on at all. She'll have a 25% chance of passing the gene on to a daughter who will have similar symptoms to her. And unfortunately, she has a 25% chance of passing a gene on to a boy. And in many cases, if that gene is passed on to a boy, it has a more severe phenotype where the child will die during pregnancy or shortly after. Um, so we really, it's really, this is just one of those cases that really stands out as the importance of you and your doctor recognizing what's the cause of your epilepsy and does it need to be worked up before you plan a pregnancy. These are not common, but it's just important to recognize. Um, for most patients, um, we can be pretty reassuring about the risk of passing on epilepsy or risk or, or passing on um, something serious. If you are the only member of your family who has epilepsy, if you don't have a lot of other um, abnormalities on your brain MRI or other things, your risk is probably not that high of passing on epilepsy. And so this is what we know from epidemiologic studies, which look at large uh, groups of people. Um, and so summary of some epidemiologic summaries that in general, the risk of epilepsy is about 1% of the population. Um, and the risk of epilepsy in a child of a mother with epilepsy is interesting, like between three and 8% for a reason that they don't completely understand. Mothers are more likely to pass on epilepsy than fathers. Um, for a father to pass it on, it's between one and 3%. But in general, again, without other risk factors for a genetic or heritable epilepsy, um, the risk is overall not that increased. But this is really important thing and where, where we are right now with genetic testing, important thing to talk to your doctor. We here at Northwestern are starting a, a epilepsy genetics clinic to help people try to find the genetic diagnosis uh, for their epilepsy when it's appropriate. Another thing about pregnancy and epilepsy that's both interesting and makes the management a little bit more complex um, is that anti-seizure medication levels can drop significantly in pregnancy. Uh, this has been best documented um, with lamotrigine or lamictal. Lamotrigine levels can drop significantly even in the first few weeks of pregnancy and throughout the pregnancy. It's been shown that if these, this drop is not recognized and managed, patients may have worse seizure control. Um, other drugs that have been associated with changes in pregnancy are levetiracetam and oxcarbazepine, uh, Keppra and Trileptal. Um, and these can change significantly too, but it's not limited to these drugs. Um, doses of seizure medications you should usually be adjusted in patients whose levels are falling. So what we typically do is before a patient gets pregnant, we check and establish what we call her baseline um, seizure medication level in her blood. Um, and, and set that as a goal level for when she's doing well. 
And then during the pregnancy, we follow it about monthly to make sure the levels are staying stable and make adjustments if, if they're not. Um, when I started doing this, a lot of my patients had gotten messages that were interesting. They said that they had been told that they could get pregnant, but they just couldn't breastfeed. Um, and fortunately, this, this perception is changing. Um, but in general, most of us who treat women with epilepsy are very much in favor of breastfeeding, even though you need to take seizure medications. Some of the seizure medications do get into breast milk. Um, but there hasn't been any evidence that this is harmful for, for the baby. And it depends on basic, uh, on what, what medication and how much is in breast milk. And it's definitely something to talk to your doctor about. But in the most part, seizure medications are considered um, safe in breastfeeding. And the benefits of breastfeeding, which include better bonding um, with the infant, decreased risk of diabetes and ear infections, um, are, and just in general, better immune system, are thought to outweigh the, any kind of potential risks of the medications being in the breast milk. The NEED study, which is the precursor to the study that I've been mentioning, had shown that actually the babies who were breastfed had better IQ, higher IQs and verbal abilities than children who were not breastfed when they were taking one of these four medications. So I'm going to switch to birth control. Um, you know, one of the things about planning a healthy pregnancy and a, and a successful pregnancy is making sure that you do it when you're ready and that it's not unplanned. But many pregnancies throughout the world and in America are unplanned, and that's true for women with epilepsy as well. Um, so some of the questions that you might want to ask is what kind of birth control is right for me? And can my medications affect my birth control or birth, can my birth control affect my seizures? Um, so it's always a good idea to discuss contraception early with your doctors, um, even if you don't need it. Uh, yet, contraception might be indicated for women with epilepsy for many reasons, uh, obviously to prevent pregnancy, and for some women need it for to regulate menstrual cycles, to control acne or symptoms of polycystic ovary syndrome, which can be more frequent in women with epilepsy, or to control heavy periods. So this is from the CDC. This is just an overview of contraceptive measures, uh, methods that are available to us, and we'll talk about a couple of them. You can see that the, the less effective methods are on the bottom, which include condoms and barrier methods and stuff like that. These are, con these are effective methods, but they are better with other methods in, in, um, uh, alongside them. The next level here are um, hormonal uh, treatments. Hormonal treatments fail about 9% of the time on average. Um, on the top is uh, a Nexplanon implant, which I'll talk about, and the, and the IUD. There's also surgical options, but those are not reversible. So that's really for uh, people who do not want to have children anymore. So what's important to know is that um, the majority, over half of our seizure medications that we have available are what we know as enzyme-inducing seizure medications. And these enzyme-inducing seizure medications can make hormonal forms of contraceptive less effective. Um, so that includes carbamazepine, clobazam, eslicarbazepine, felbamate, oxcarbazepine, phenobarbital, phenytoin, parampanil, and sopiramate. The ones with stars next to them and oxcarbazepine have research to suggest that the effect is more at higher doses of these medications. Um, and so some people argue that with lower doses, it's safe to use hormonal contraception. And my perspective on that is you're either pregnant or you're not. Um, and so I, I try to recommend to use additional forms of contraception um, rather than just kind of hope that a low dose is not an issue. Um, so with those enzyme-inducing um, forms of contraception, um, these enzyme-inducing, sorry, anti-seizure medications, the following forms of hormonal contraception are really less ideal. So that would be any kind of hormonal pill, um, a hormonal patch, a hormonal ring. Um, the shot, um, depomedroxyprogesterone, known as Depo-Provera, has a very high dose of hormone. Um, and so the CDC and the World Health Organization think that this is still an acceptable form with anti-seizure medications that are enzyme-inducing. Um, not all of our medications, by the way, are enzyme-inducing. The per, uh, levonorgestrel implant, this is a progesterone implant that gets put in the arm. This one may be um, okay with enzyme-inducing seizure medications. However, there were a few pregnancies reported. Um, the World Health Organization says it should work. Again, I, I advise caution with that combination. Um, and then we're going to talk about the intrauterine device, which is a highly effective form of contraception. So the, um, the levonorgestrel IUD is a little plastic device that gets inserted by a doctor into the uterus. Um, it's appropriate for women of all ages. So we used to think the IUD was just for after you gave birth, but now actually the American Academy of Pediatrics advocates for it as a form of contraception for 
um, for teens. Um, and so we can certainly use it in women before they get pregnant. Um, it releases progesterone locally. So it doesn't really act like these hormonal contraceptions that affect that throughout the body. Um, and so a lot of times people ask me, well, I can't, my OB said I can't have this progesterone IUD because it interacts with my seizure medications. So that's not true. So we still think that the progesterone IUD is fine if you're taking any kind of seizure medication. It may make your period stop and it can help relieve painful periods. Um, there's three kinds that are available and they can last between three and five years. There's also a copper IUD which has no hormones and this lasts up to 10 years, but periods often get heavier with this type of contraception. Um, so the intrauterine device, I'm hoping they'll make a purple one like this uh, for in honor of epilepsy. Um, it's very effective for preventing pregnancy. It does not, however, treat symptoms of polycystic ovary symptom, and it does not protect, protect against sexually transmitted diseases. So people who are using this for contraception should also be using condoms as well. The, this is data from um, a, the Epilepsy and Birth Control Registry, um, which is run um, by Andrew Herzog in Boston. He's been collecting data on, on patients with epilepsy who report themselves about their experience with, um, with different forms of contraception. Um, and so it's a, a very worthwhile thing to contribute to. Um, the, what he has um, demonstrated, similar to what you might expect, is that the IUD in women with epilepsy has a very low failure rate. He quoted 3%. That's slightly higher than in, in other women, but this is a self-reported study. There was a big study in the, there was not a, there was a medium-sized study in the UK looking at this, and the failure rate of the IUD was just similar to or slightly higher, like 1% to 1.5%, I believe. Barrier methods like condoms were exactly what we would expect, um, just like in the general population, about 12%, but the effectiveness of hormonal contraception was, was lower than you would expect in women not taking seizure medications. Um, and not too different from the withdrawal method, which we know is not very effective. So um, this is just kind of a summary. I'll skip that of what we just talked about. So what to know about birth control and seizure medications. Most seizure medications can make hormonal forms of contraception less effective. Again, that's not all. It's more than half. Um, uh, there are other, there are seizure medications that are not enzyme inducers and are fine with hormonal contraception. But when we actually looked in our group, one of the things to think about is that as you start your kind of treatment plan with your doctor, your medications may change several times. And so we found that the majority of women in our, in our clinics that we followed, even though they didn't start on a medication that would make hormonal contraception less effective, they often ended up one that would interact with it. Um, and hormonal contraception, the other thing to know is that hormonal contraception that contains estrogen can make certain seizure medications less effective. Um, so this is a letter um, from a patient who contacted me. Um, she was a patient who started having epilepsy as a teen, and she was doing very well um, when she finally got to a good dose of lamotrigine that was working for her. And then when she went to college, she was started on a birth control pill. Um, and after that, she had three seizures. She had just gotten her driver's license. And, and so this changes things. She asked her OB at the time and her neurologist if it was the birth control pills, and she was told no. Um, so it was actually her initiative to say, well, I think there's something here. And she found me based on a podcast like this I had done many years ago and said, you know, I think there's a connection here. And she was absolutely right because the birth control pills had essentially cut her lamotrigine levels in half. So it was as if she was taking half the dose um, that she was taking previously. Um, so lamotrigine can actually affect birth control. I didn't put it on that original list. It's a very mild effect. It only affects the progesterone component of birth control, but that is one thing to be aware of, can make that less effective, and birth control affects lamotrigine. Um, so a summary, we just talked about that, that it can, birth control methods that contain estrogen can lower lamicta levels. If you start any of those methods while on lamotrigine, your doctor needs to know about it in advance. And what we do for our patients, we need to be on birth control pills, because many of them do not just for contraception, but they also want to be on it for, like we said, some of the symptoms of polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, and so we will adjust the lamotrigine dose for them. We'll say the day you start your pill, you increase your dose by this much, and then you stay on it. Um, the people who take a placebo week will find that their lamotrigine levels will fluctuate. So they'll be, you know, 
if they're, say, let's say they're at a number of five during most of the month, they can go up to an eight or a nine when they're on their placebo week. Um, so one, that's just something that's been a ver very aware of. We have patients who sometimes call and say, all of a sudden I started having symptoms of double vision or dizziness, which are lamotrigine toxicity symptoms. It can be because they're on their placebo week. Um, one way we can avoid that is asking the OB if they're willing to prescribe the birth control pills throughout the month uh, without a placebo week, skipping the placebo pack, going from pack to pack. Um, so we mentioned, I mentioned that lamotrigine may affect how well the progesterone part of the birth control works. Um, and for most people think that that's not an issue with the birth control pills or with many of the, um, many of the hormonal contraception we are available, but I usually do recommend using condoms as well if you're using that combination. And again, the hormonal containing IUD will not interfere with lamotrigine. Uh, so what can you do about epilepsy and birth control to make sure you're in, heading in the right direction? Talk to your doctors about how your medication will affect your birth control and vice versa. Discuss what your needs are and your concerns about birth control. So it's very different if you're on birth control because you're trying to avoid pregnancy and, what, and different if you're trying to use it to control your symptoms. Consider notifying your doctor in advance if you would like some time alone to discuss. So, you know, a lot of times patients come in with their mothers or they're there. So it might be good to let them know in a busy clinic that, you know, can send a message now through the portals or I'd like a little bit of time alone to talk to the doctor and then they can kind of navigate that. Um, and then if you're sexually active to use condoms in addition to hormonal contraception or, or birth control or an IUD. So I think I stopped there um, for questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gerard. We'll now uh, go to the Q&A session. I thought that was terrifically informative. Thank you so much. Um, again, uh, participants, if you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A tab located at the bottom of the Zoom panel and click send, and Brandon will go ahead and read them out loud. Sure, actually our first question, um, Gerard touches on a, uh, a slide that you presented earlier. Um, are there a lot of known genes like filament A where you have a 50% chance of actually passing on um, that particular mutation to your child? There are, there are, there's a growing number of genes where, um, there are a growing number of genes where we know that the, that they can be passed on where what's called an autosomal dominant form. So the, the one that I showed was an X-linked form, but there is a growing number of autosomal dominant genes that can be passed on. Um, you know, one of the ones is that was actually a cure, there was a cure uh, email today about the SCN1A gene. But that's a very complicated gene because you have a 50% of chance of passing it on, but the, the symptoms in somebody who inherits it can vary. So somebody who can inherit it could be very normal with just um, febrile seizures, and another person who inherits, uh, inherits it or could, be, could have a more severe epileptic encephalopathy known as Dravet syndrome. Um, so, so that's an example of an autosomal dominant gene where you have a 50% chance of passing it on. Um, and it's, um, and it's also an example of what makes it very difficult to do genetic counseling and genetic testing, uh, pre-pregnancy. There are a growing number, still small, but a growing number of genes, um, that are autosomal dominant. And I typically look in an adult population that can be, passed on. So one of the ones is um, the LGI1 gene, which is uh, associated with focal temporal lobe epilepsy with auditory features. So a lot of patients will hear symptoms before their seizures. It's traditionally a pretty mild syndrome. Um, and then there are the gator complex genes. So DEPTC5, NPL3, NPL2. So there's, these are just some examples. And I don't have a specific number for you at this time of the number of autosomal dominant genes, but it's growing. Um, uh, and so that's an important thing to look at. Signs that you might have an autosomal dominant gene in your family, um, although it could always start with the individual who has epilepsy, but uh, signs that it might be in your family are if you have several close relatives, usually first degree relatives in your, in your family. Um, and that would be one of the things that would, if so, patients seeing me, elevate my recommendation to consider genetic testing. Great, thank you. Um, the next question actually is also a follow-up question on uh, one of the slides you presented earlier. And um, that was, if you're no longer looking to become pregnant, what are the reasons to stay on folic acid? Um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, 
we traditionally recommend to all of our women who might get pregnant to be on some folic acid. Um, again, how much varies for patients who are still of reproductive age before menopause. I usually have my patients on one milligram, although they're not really planning pregnancy. We can usually go down to the lower amount that's in a women's multivitamin or a prenatal vitamin. Um, some people feel it's uh, good for hair and nails and stuff like that, but I, there's not really any strong evidence that uh, to treat the epilepsy or other symptoms that a woman needs to continue on folic acid other than planning pregnancy. We just traditionally continue it. We don't usually continue it after menopause. Thank you very much. Um, switching gears a little bit, the next question came in. Um, I'm wanting to know about, are there strategies during, uh, for, for women with epilepsy um, during labor or are C-sections um, more recommended or more common? That's an excellent question. Um, so uh, we actually do not recommend C-sections for women with epilepsy. It, um, there isn't any indication any that, that, um, that just because of having a seizure disorder or having epilepsy that you need a C-section. Um, in our MONI trial, um, they're looking at this data, but there are very few in academic centers who know this information. It's very rare to have C-sections done for purposes of epilepsy. Um, so we don't consider it a, a risk for for C-sections. There have been studies that have shown um, in our country and in other countries that C-sections are more commonly done for patients with epilepsy, um, but we suspect that this is more of just providers thinking that they need to do that where, uh, rather than any kind of clear indication that needs to be done. Great. Uh, so the next question actually came in um, and it actually deals with a, a model um, that this woman follows called the Creighton model. Um, and she wanted to know if there were studies being done on this methodology and, uh, and its uses in better understanding women in epilepsy. I'm not familiar with the Creighton model. I'm not sure if I can answer that. Maybe if there, okay. you have any more details on that or? Um, it was just the, the Creighton NA Pro model. Um, actually helps understand the cycle and whether there is a correlation between seizures and cycles. Oh, I can speak to that. I don't know the Creighton method per se, um, but I can speak to the issue of uh, what's known as catamenial epilepsy, um, uh, if that's the question. But I, I'm not. I'm not sure about the 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 Creighton model. I could. I have a. There. It's. It's long been known that. Um, you know, epilepsy can respond to hormonal fluctuations. Um, so I had a few slides on that, but there's. The um, about 30% of women with epilepsy will find that in some way their seizure frequency syncs up with their cycles. Um, and so it's not usually in my experience, not exclusively that, but it's if you have more, more seizures during certain periods of the month, often it's the few days before the period leading into the few days afterwards. I may actually, I can actually show some, I had a couple extra slides. Let's see. Um, So there's a couple of different periods that people seem to be vulnerable um, to, uh, to seizures of, again, 30% of women, and those tend to be about ovulation or towards the end of the cycle. These, these patterns have been defined, designed by Dr. Her Herzog. Um, and so, yes, for many of my patients, there's different ways. This is an ovulation tracker that you can follow um, your period. This is actually a way we used to do in our clinic where we followed temperatures. Um, and your temperature goes up when you ovulate and through the end of the cycle. And so you can see for this patient, these are, this is her temperatures. This is likely where she ovulated and this is where her period started and she had more seizures. Uh, this is the period here. She had more seizures both around the time of ovulation and then leading up to her, um, leading up to her period. Treatment for hormonally sensitive epilepsy. And I, I don't, I'm not a believer that hormones cause the epilepsy, but that it's one of many triggers that can cause a person's epilepsy, that can trigger people's epilepsy, just like sleep deprivation or alcohol or stuff like that. Um, and so recognizing these kind of patterns, I'm not sure of the Creighton method, but any other method, um, you know, can be very useful for women first, just to identify the vulnerable periods of the month. Um, and then there's other strategies that are usually add-on strategies to try to control catamenial seizures. So this is my patient's seizures here. Um, uh, I like to stress that I don't think that hormonal treatments or approaches to hormonal modifications typically re uh, replace standard epilepsy treatments. Um, we still do first-line treatments, anti-seizure medication, surgery for proshmids, but sometimes there are hormonal treatments that are given in addition to standard therapies. The evidence for this, though, is very limited. Um, 
And then uh, the other thing you can do though, and that I often do is that if you can recognize the pattern, which maybe the participant was asking about, you can often give timed extra medications at the vulnerable periods of the cycle. And that can be very useful as well. That's great. And actually you were able to answer two additional questions that I had come in as well. So uh, that was fantastic. Um, uh, the next question is for women with epilepsy, um, what resources are available uh, that can help them really track their seizures and track their menstrual cycles? So um, seizuretracker.com, um, I, I know that they have been developing, um, it's a great way to track your seizures and you can share with your doctor. There's also a, a, um, the ability to put in your periods as well. Um, many of my um, younger patients just find that um, period tracker apps that are, there's a ton of them available that you can, um, they just do that and you can put symptoms in there as well. Um, but seizure tracker is nice if you are in a computer. Um, I don't know, I know they were working on it. I don't know if you can yet actually put the information in on your phone. That's the only limitation for your periods, but it's, uh, they were working on developing that. And right now on a computer, at least you can put in your periods as well as your seizures and you can print out that information and provide it to your doctor. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and actually the last question uh, that we just had come in, so we have time for one more question. Um, why is the PCOS, um, is more, why is PCOS more common in women with epilepsy? So um, not completely known, there's some interesting research on that, but the, uh, one of the reasons that we feel is actually early exposure to valproic acid or Depakote. So women who are exposed to valproic acid or Depakote in their teens are much higher risk of having um, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, but there's some other research in animals um, and that, that there may be something to the, to the um, epilepsy itself and to the frequency of seizures that may predispose to polycystic ovary syndrome, not just the valproic acid um, explanation. Uh, and some of this may be because seizures, particularly temporal lobe seizures, you know, involve the temporal lobes, which is right near and gives feedback to the hypothalamus which and pituitary, which then regulate how ovulation. And so there are some theories about that, that there may be a direct effect on sort of hormonal function um, that may lead to it. But those are the two main theories. One is the valproic acid, and then the other is, um, uh, is this regulation of cycles. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gerard. Great. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Gerard, for your presentation and to the Band Foundation for sponsoring today's webinar and our entire webinar series. So this concludes our webinar on epilepsy, pregnancy, and contraception. I'd like to thank our audience as well today for your engagement and asking some great questions. Uh, if you have any additional questions about the topic or wish to learn more about any of CURE's research programs uh, or our future webinars, please visit our website at www.cureepilepsy.org or you can email us at info at cureepilepsy.org. I also encourage you to check out some of CURE's other programming, include, including our newly launched Seizing Life podcast, which is being hosted by Kelly Cervantes. We also have a number of Cure Day of Science events that are coming up across the country. So please stay tuned for those as well. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all again. I hope you will enjoy us, uh, join us on uh, April 25th for our webinar discussing transitioning from pediatric to adult epilepsy care. Thank you.